Just this morning, I'm not the man I used to be. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Where's that found? Somebody tell me. Second Corinthians 5.17, right? It is great to be here this morning. Whenever Pastor Kent calls me, first of all, it's a delight to talk to him. Uh, but then when he asked me to fill in for him, that is always an enormous, immense privilege. And I see a number of old faces and I see some new faces. And since I've been here last, uh, some interesting things have happened uh, in my life, in my wife's life. Our youngest daughter just got engaged a few weeks ago. <laughs> And her fiancé bought her this gorgeous, gorgeous engagement ring. And I said to Kitty, I said, well, Kitty, have you shown your friends? Oh, yeah, Dad. Did they admire it? Oh, yeah. In fact, four of them even recognized it. <laughs> That's not really true. The guy that she <laughs> is engaged to is a tremendous individual. In fact, you know, she was saying to me, Dad, the first time I kissed him, I have to tell you, a cold chill ran down my back like I've never experienced before. And then I realized his popsicle was dripping. <laughs> no, we're grateful to the Lord that uh, he has brought James into our daughter's life. You know, my daughter has brought home some real doozies over the years. In fact, one of them said to her, on what grounds does your dad object to me? And Kitty said, on any grounds within 10 miles of the home. <laughs> it's great to be here. It really is. If you have your Bibles, hopefully you do. Turn to me to the, with me, if you will, to the third chapter of the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading verses 10 and 11. Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11. Paul writes that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. It's not what you know, it's who you know. All of us here this morning have heard that statement, which certainly could serve as a useful summary of the verses here which we have just read. See, Paul makes it clear here that what's really important, what really counts in life, is not just knowing, but knowing Christ. Which, as verse 10 reveals, was Paul's ultimate aim, his ultimate goal, his ultimate ambition. To know Christ, that was Paul's all-consuming passion. And not just his passion, but his privilege. Because, like he articulates in verses 7 and 8 of this third chapter, since he was not trusting in any of his religious credentials for salvation, but in Christ alone, a relationship with the Lord, with the Lord of glory, had been established. Knowing Christ, knowing Christ as a believer, not just theoretically, but experientially in a very intimate way, day after day as we journey through life, that's what Paul is talking about here. And like that was his ambition, that must be our ambition as well. And we see here in this passage this morning, in a specific sense, what that means. What does it mean to know Christ? Or to put it another way, how are we to know Christ? And to begin with this morning, we are to know the fullness of Christ's power. We are to know the fullness of Christ's power. Look again with me at verse 10. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection. You know, one of the things that makes Christianity unique, 
from every other religion in the world is this thing, this momentous event, which is spoken about here, namely the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. No other founder of any other religion has been resurrected from the dead. Muhammad is dead and gone. The founder of Buddhism is dead and gone, but Jesus Christ is alive. He declared in Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys to both death and hell. Now, of course, the resurrection was an occurrence, as we see here, that was characterized by great power, which is why Paul talks here about the power of the resurrection. And the power that raised Christ from the dead was a power that all three members of the Godhead had a hand in. Who is it that raised Christ from the dead? I'll tell you, the Father. To begin with, the Father raised Christ from the dead. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Acts 2, 22 through 24. Who raised Christ from the dead? God the Father did. Who else raised Christ from the dead? God the Spirit did. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated on the gospel of God, which he had promised to fore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Romans 1, 1 through 4. Who raised Christ from the dead? God the Father did. God the Spirit did. And Christ himself raised himself from the dead. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own power. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. John 10, 17, and 18. The power that raised Christ from the dead was a power that all three members of the Godhead participated in, and what an awesome power it was. You know, many people today are concerned about Iran getting their hands on a nuclear weapon because of the tremendous power that a nuclear bomb possesses. But I want to tell you this morning, the power of a nuclear device, even the most devastating kind of nuclear device, is absolutely nothing in comparison with the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, which is why we sometimes sing, death could not keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. Now, the great thing about this resurrection power, and the point Paul is making here is that it's available to you. If you know Christ on an ongoing basis, in your everyday walk with the Lord, let me repeat that, because the implications of this are absolutely staggering. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead if you know him, is available to you on an everyday basis as you're on this pilgrim journey to glory. Now, what does this mean? I mean, practically speaking, pragmatically. I'll tell you what it means. There's no problem. Believer in Jesus Christ, there's no problem. There's no challenge. There's no difficulty. There's no temptation that you do not have the power to overcome. You know, sometimes even believers in Jesus Christ can be caught saying, I can't handle this. I just can't take the pressure. I can't stand the heat. So as the saying goes, I have to get out of the kitchen. Literally, in some cases, I have to get out of the kitchen of the home that I'm in. Out of this life that I'm in. 
I can't take it anymore. Believer in Jesus Christ, that is simply not true. Through the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus, you can cope with anything, absolutely anything, in triumphant fashion that life throws your way. With any of life's unexpected curveballs, some of which in your wildest imaginations you never, ever, ever thought you'd have to deal with. Let me ask you this morning, believer, what are you going through? Are you confronted with a nagging illness? If so, let me tell you, instead of being down, instead of having a perpetual pity party for yourself, instead of walking around saying, woe is me to anybody who will listen, and even to those individuals who don't want to listen, you have the capacity, in spite of your physical circumstances, to radiate the joy of the Lord. And to focus in on others instead of yourself. And to be a blessing instead of a bore. Maybe you're here this morning and you're in a difficult marriage situation. And you're wondering to yourself how you're going to remain with the individual who you have vowed to remain with until death do you part for the next 30 minutes, let alone the next 30 years. I mean, day after day, your marriage is nothing other, but a, nothing other than a miserable experience, so much so that you're about to go down to the ba Ambassador Bridge and do a 180 off it. Again, believer, you're not in an impossible situation. With the resurrection power of Christ at your disposal, you are not in an impossible situation. You not only have the ability to continue on, you have the ability to be a sensational spouse. A sensational husband or wife to your perhaps less than sensational spouse, which you know can have an impact upon them. You know, I'm reminded of 1 Peter 3, 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the behavior of their wives. You know, we must never forget this morning that spouses who attempt to make a bad situation or a good situation out of a bad situation at times can cause their spouse to come around. Oh, Pastor Don, you have no idea. I mean, my spouse is really a louse. Bless them. Love them. Pray for them. Share the word of God with them. And remember that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you could ever ask or think. I can't do that, Pastor. I mean, you don't understand the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection power of Christ is at your disposal. Now, of course, none of this can happen if you refuse to avail yourself of that. And you just throw up your arms and say, I quit. You know, perhaps this morning you've run into all sorts of financial difficulties. And it's causing you no end of stress which is exhibiting itself in a variety of ugly ways. You know, you're awake at three in the morning, wondering how you're gonna pay the bills, and you're short with your wife and your kids. Once again, because of Christ's resurrection power, that does not have to be your experience. Now, you can be on the verge of financial ruin. Do you know that? With a, with a song in your heart, with a peace that passes all understanding. You know, later on in the book of Philippians, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul will write, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, which is absolutely out of this world, shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, every believer has peace with God. 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, Romans 5, 1, through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a believer this morning, God no longer has a case against you. That wasn't always the case, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God at one time did have a case against you, but now that you've come to Christ, that's the enmity between you and God has been eliminated. Now you're a child of the Most High God. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You're a blue blood, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9, every believer has peace with God, but not every believer has the peace of God. But through the resurrection power of Christ, that can be yours. Believer, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you are facing, you know, it may be a difficult temptation that over the years have bold, has bowled you over so many times that you've almost worn out 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We call that the Christian's bar of soap. Lord, I got to approach you again on the basis of 1 John 1, 9 because I flubbed up again. I flubbed up again, just like yesterday, and the day before, and the day before, and the day before, and the day before. That doesn't have to be your pattern of life through the all-sufficient resurrection power of Christ. You can eliminate those sin patterns that have been so ingrained in your experience, you know, the book of Hebrews talks about that sin which does so easily beset us. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and that sin which does so easily beset us. What's your Achilles heel? It doesn't have to be your Achilles heel anymore. You know, Trevor Baskerville, uh, an individual years ago, was visiting one of the great hydroelectric plants in the United States, and he's, he walked out on the mile-long dam and observed tons and tons of water going over it. He said to his guide, let me ask you, what percent of the power from this river do you actually transform into electricity, and how much goes over the dam and is lost. And his guide shook his head and he said, we don't even use one hundredth part of it. You know, it's been suggested that human beings utilize only a tiny fraction of the brains that they have been endowed with. In my case, I use a very tiny fraction of the brain that I've been endowed with. Well, sadly, in the same way, Christian people often use just a tiny fraction of the power that God has so graciously given to them, made available to them. Like that hydroelectric plant, they convert so little of it into real use. Now, I've been here at Grace Centers of Hope teaching and preaching. I mean, what a joy to see individuals come to a saving knowledge of Christ, to hear testimonies. But you know, there are times I've walked into the classroom, so-and-so has relapsed. Well, relapsed? And they're a believer? Oh yeah, they got saved, but they relapsed. No, the great thing is, they're still saved. Salvation has nothing to do with us. The reason you are here this morning as a believer is because 
God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 4. He took away the blindness that was before our eyes, for you see if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them who are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. And it's because you were drawn to God by the Father, for no man can come unto me except the Father who hath sent me, draw him, John 6, 44. And it's ultimately because you were quickened by the Spirit of God. You hath he made alive who were dead, Ephesians 2, 1, in trespasses and sins. It had nothing to do with you. You had nothing to do with getting saved, and you can have nothing to do with getting unsaved. They relapse, Pastor Dodd, while they're still saved. I'm grateful for that. You can never lose your salvation. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. But let me ask you, why did they relapse? Don't they have, don't they realize, they don't have to, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. The power that raised Christ from the dead can be yours today. Can be yours tomorrow. Can be yours on Tuesday can be yours on Wednesday, can be yours when you're facing that particularly acute temptation. Just lock into it. You know, one of the great prayers of Paul in the New Testament is found in the first chapter of the book of Colossians, where Paul writes, for this reason, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to give thanks to God for you and to pray that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Believer, you can do it. You can do it. I can do all, again, later on in the book of Philippians, I can, I can, you know, Christians of all people should have a can-do attitude. Amen. I can, Philippians 4.13, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does it mean to know Christ? How are we to know Christ? Well, first of all, we're to know Christ in the fullness of his power. And secondly, this morning, we are to know the fellowship of Christ's persecutions. Again, we read in verse 10, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. You know, unlike so many people today, even unlike certain Christian people, the Apostle Paul was not looking for a comfy existence. Uh-uh. He wasn't looking for a nice home in the burbs, comfortable living, comfortable living situation, a good job, the white picket fence experience. He wasn't aspiring to the great American dream. No, he was concerned about faithfulness to the Lord Christ, to his Savior. And if that involved being persecuted, if that involved sufferings, his attitude was, bring it on. Bring it on. Even if that means my death, which for the Apostle Paul, which in Paul's case, that's exactly what it did mean. Even if it means my death, bring it on. The fellowship of Christ's sufferings. You know, thus far, you and I here in America have had it pretty easy, haven't we? You know, individuals, this is Memorial Day weekend, and we commemorate those individuals who have given their lives so that we might enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy in the United States of America. We enjoy so many freedoms, and we have religious freedom. We've had it easy. But the early church did not have it easy. 
Which is why Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. You know, if church history is correct, every single one of Christ's apostles were martyred for their fidelity to Christ. Every single one, except for John, who was banished for his Christian testimony to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. The early Christians, did, we've got it easy. The early Christians did not have it easy. And there are believers throughout our world today who do not have it easy. We've got it easy now, but I want to suggest to you this morning, not for long. And when persecution does come our way, we need to have Paul's attitude. If faithfulness to the Lord... If the glory of God demands that I suffer, that I be persecuted, then bring it on. Then I want to know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Then I want to identify with Christ in what he went through. Recognizing, of course, that it is impossible to fully identify with what Christ went through for the sake of lost sinners. See, in addition prior to the cross to being spat upon and to being beaten and to have a, in addition to having a, a crown of thorns being impaled upon his head, his precious head on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ suffered an eternity of punishment for lost humanity. That's why he had to be God. Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross had to suffer what we would have had to suffer were we to go to hell. How long do people go to hell for? These shall be punished with everlasting punishment, 2 Thessalonians 1. Now they go to hell forever. That's one of the things that makes hell horrific. People go there forever. There's no coffee break. There's no time off for good behavior. There's no vacation time. And in order to accomplish redemption on our behalf, Christ had to suffer what we would have had to suffer were we to go to hell. He had to suffer an infinite amount. And only an infinite God can suffer an infinite amount in a limited space of time. In order to accomplish redemption on our behalf, Christ had to be God. Because he had to suffer an infinite amount in a limited space of time, in a finite space of time, and he had to be man in order to represent me. Now that is something, suffering an infinite amount on Calvary's cross, that is something that none of us will be able to identify with. No matter how much persecution we may have to endure, but again, if it means the glory of God, then to the extent of my capacity, I want to share in Christ's sufferings. You know, we should be so glad and grateful this morning that that was the, the posture of a number of individuals, outstanding believers down throughout history, like Martin Luther, who before his second appearance at the Diet of Worms in the 16th century, during the critical days of the Protestant Reformation, cried out to God saying, Thou hast chosen me for this work. I know it well. I'm ready to lay down my life for thy truth, patient as a lamb, for it is the cause of justice. It is thine. And individuals like Polycarp, the venerable bishop of Smyrna, in the second century, Polycarp was asked to revile Christ or be burned at the stake. And he replied this way, 80 and 6 years have I served him and he never did me wrong. Never once. Never did me wrong. Ever. And how can I now blaspheme my king who has saved me? Burn me at the stake. And individuals like John Huss, one of the forerunners of the Protestant Reformation, who after being charged with heresy, was also burned at the stake on July 6, 1415, as he was making his way to his place of execution, Huss passed through a churchyard where he noticed a bunch of his books being burned. And when he saw this, he laughed, and then when he arrived at the execution spot, he said to the marshal of the empire, God is my witness that the evidence against me is false. 
I have never thought nor preached except with the one intention of winning men, if possible, from their sins. In the truth of the gospel, I have written, taught, and preached, and today I will gladly die. Now, these individuals could have echoed Paul's words here, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And they could also echo Paul's words at the tail end of his life. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. See, it's through the cross, only through the cross, through the cross comes the crown. Through pain, it comes the prize. If we endure, 2 Timothy 2.12, we shall also reign with him. Well, Paul concludes in verse 11, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, the NIV translates this, and somehow, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead, Paul is saying here, I'm prepared to arrive at the future resurrection of my body anyway. If I die a martyr's death and then am resurrected, great. If I die a natural death and then, am, and then am resurrected, that's okay as well. Only let Christ be glorified. And earlier on in the book of Philippians, Philippians 1, 20 and 21, Paul wrote, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness now as always, Christ shall be magnified in my body whether by death or by life. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. To know Christ, not just theoretically, but experientially, that was Paul's ultimate goal in life. And it must be our goal as well. To know Christ in the fullness of his power. And to know, the, to know Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings or persecutions. That's to be in a no-win situation. K-N-O-W, no-win situation. I mean, what could be better than to live a life triumphantly through the power of Christ's resurrection? And what could be better than consciously storing up for yourself treasures in heaven? as a result of being faithful, even in the midst of persecution, suffering, adverse circumstances. That's what it means to really live. You know, believer, God is, Christ came to this earth, not just to provide us with eternal life, but to provide us with the abundant life in the here and now. I have come, John 10.10, 10, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly in the existential present. Now, you know, sometimes you'll ask a believer, how you doing? Okay, under the circumstances. Believer, what are you doing under them? Talk about atomic power. Is God a liar? Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? God's not a liar. And God says that heroin doesn't have to rule your life because of the resurrection power that's available to you. That's what God said. Now, either he's a liar, that's true. Cocaine doesn't have to rule your life because of the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus that's available to you. Now, either God's a liar, that's true. A mad Dog 2020 doesn't have to rule your life. Whiskey, rum and coke doesn't have to rule your life. 
Because the resurrection power of Christ is available to you. Now, either God's a liar, that's true. Walk in his power. You have three titanic foes, the world, the flesh, and the devil, all trying to trip you up. But you know something? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Pastor Don, she relapsed. Why? You may be here this morning and you're not a Christian. This has no application to whether you're in bondage. So many individuals will testify to you that they too, in this very auditorium, that they too were in bondage, not anymore. But if you're not saved, you're in bondage. You're in a moral straitjacket. You can't get free. For when you were the slaves of sin, you were free from all righteousness. We read in Romans 6.20, the slaves of sin. Don't tell me that slavery is done in America. It's not done at all. The vast majority of Americans are slaves right now. They're slaves to sin and they're slaves to Satan. But there's freedom in Christ. And only in Christ. You shall know the truth, John 8, 32, and the truth shall make you. For only Christ will liberate you, emancipate you. Only the Lord Jesus. You try some alternative means... You'll still be in bondage. I remember when I first came here and Ken was showing me around the place and he introduced me to a young lady and he said, give Pastor Don your testimony. And this young lady said to me, you know, I was a suburban mom. Hooked on heroin. I was a suburban mom hooked on heroin, and I tried this, and I tried this program, and I tried over here, and I went there. Nothing worked. Then I came to Grace Centers of Hope. I got saved. That worked. That worked. This over here didn't work. This didn't work. This, that worked. It'll work for you. Jesus said, the tale end of Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Are you, are you tired? Are you so tired? Would you be free from your burden of sin? You're thirsty this morning. Drinks are on the house. Oh, everyone who thirsts, let him come to the waters, and you have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price, Isaiah 55, 1. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. You're tired. You're fed up. You're depressed. I have one answer for you. Uh, one, one remedy. I, just one solution is Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. He's the door, John 10, 9. He's the light of the world, John 8, 12. He's the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in him shall never die. Believest thou this? There's an answer for a rotten, depraved, filthy sinner like Don McKay. There's hope in Jesus Christ. Not just for me, but for you. Trust Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Father, we, uh, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for saving grace. And then, Father, we thank you for sustaining grace, for the power that's available to us as believers to live the kind of life that you would have us live. Uh, so, Father, may we not give in. May we take a hold of. 
the power that raised Christ from the dead. May we be on top of our circumstances through him. Should there be those in this auditorium this morning that are not saved, we pray that you would save them. In Jesus' name, amen.